where we have that special election that we need to finance. So please buy generously. And Nancy's right here. That's why you never get elected when you run. <laughs> Sorry, congratulations. Thank you.
to uh, move on to our main speaker. I'd like to ask Jennifer Horn, the New Hampshire GOP chairman, to, uh, to come forward. We have a, a few things that uh, we're going to ask her to do. First of all is uh, to read a letter from Senator Kelly Ayotte, and then to introduce Colonel West. Andrew's trying to keep me short. All I'm allowed to do is read the letter and introduce the Colonel. But I mean, I'm the chairman now, so uh, I, I want to say um, I was just having a lovely conversation uh, outside the room with some good folks. And where's Peter? Peter Silva, where's he sitting? Is he right under my nose somewhere? Or did he leave the room? Peter. Dottie Price lives in your ward, and she will do anything she can to help you get elected. I just saw her outside. She promised that wherever Dottie is, I just said it in public, you got to follow through. So uh, I need everybody in this room. If you live in Nashua, if you live in Hillsborough County, if you live in the great state of New Hampshire, we need you to come down into Nashua and help with Peter's race. We've got to win that seat back. And he's from our great Senator Kelly Ayotte. Uh, dear Nashua Republican City Committee members and guests, thank you for gathering today with fellow Republicans as we continue our critical efforts toward victory in 2014. Together we will ensure that New Hampshire and our nation is again governed by a majority of Republicans. That effort begins here in Nashua with Pete Silva's special election for state representative. We will ensure victory in this race and throughout the state and country by banding together to support those conservative tenets of individual liberty, personal responsibility, and limited government that we all hold dear. I would like to thank you for all you do to advance our party's important goals. I look forward to working with each of you in this important fight to protect the state and country we all love. Best wishes, Kelly A. Ayotte, U.S. Senator. U.S. Senator, what an extraordinary job she's doing on behalf of the great people of New Hampshire. If you want somebody who's going to stand on principle and be a voice for what we know is right, you can look to Senator Ayotte, who took a principled and difficult stand on the gun vote that has cost her dearly, and she did it because she knew she was right. She's been the leading voice trying to track down the truth of what happened in Benghazi, and from the day she was elected, she has been the loudest voice in Washington for a balanced budget and fiscally responsible policy. She is fighting for us, and I hope that you've got her back, because I know she's got yours. to be a Republican in New Hampshire today. It is good to be a Republican in the Granite State. We have good things happening. We just won a special election in June out in Claremont in a very blue city, in a very blue seat that was held by a Democrat, and we took it back to a Republican candidate. And that's just the beginning. We're going to win Pete Silva's seat. We're going to win three more special elections after that. And we're going to go into next year with the momentum and the excitement and the support and the ground game that we need to win all of our races next year. I am so pleased that we finally have some people looking at these seats, some candidates, some potential candidates, helping us get the message out there. We need all of you to help us get the message out. Governor Hassan has been a dismal failure. Yeah. Right out of, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right out of the gate trying to balance the state budget on money that literally is fictitious, money that doesn't exist. And what happened? Completely fell apart. Was she surprised that casino gambling didn't pass in New Hampshire? Has it ever passed the other 12 or 15 or 347 times that they've tried to pass it? So we can do better. We can do better. We know what we need to succeed. We know that the policies of the Republican Party of limited government, personal freedom, unlimited opportunity, those are principles that when we translate them into policy, lift up the entire community. 
no matter who you are, or where you come from, or what you look like, or what your political affiliation is, those are policies that make life better for all of us. And that's what we have to remember, because that's what our message is as Republicans. When you vote Republican, it helps your family. It helps your community. It lifts us all up together. And we want to make sure that we're standing together, that we're united, that our message is united, and that we're all working together to promote the message, to get our candidates across the finish line. Because I promise you, as I stand here today, that when elections are over in November of 2014, Republicans are going to own the House, Republicans are going to own the Senate, we're going to win our federal, federal races, and come hell or high water, we are winning back the corner office. That is what we're here for, don't you forget it. I am honored to be able to introduce our keynote speaker this evening. This is a man of extraordinary heart, patriotism, and service to our great nation. He has served in the United States military for 22 years. He served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he has served us uh, in Washington as a United States congressman. He has been a loud, clear, articulate voice for strong, conservative, Republican <laughs> values, those values that we all fight for every day that make our nation great, that make our nation strong. And we need a lot more voices like this out there. I am so pleased to introduce to you U.S. Congressman uh, and Marine Colonel Alan West. Very good haircuts. <laughs> you know, it is, I tell you, Marines, Marines, Marines. They got great commercials, they got great uniforms, they get all the ladies, and they even stole, you know, my introduction. <laughs> but thanks so much, Madam Chairwoman, for having me here. Thanks so much, Andrew, to all the elected officials, to all the candidates. It really is an honor to be up here in the Granite State. I cannot believe that I'm standing here with you today. But uh, you just need to know heartfelt how special this is for me. Now, I can tell you that I can stand up here and I can talk about tax policy. Should we move from the progressive tax code to a flat tax? Should we have a fair tax? I can talk about regulatory policies and how they're affecting business growth. I can talk about monetary policy, quantitative easing, all the bad things that it means with print money and the inflationary uh, second and third order effects. But what I want to talk to you about is something more personal. And what I want to talk to you about is what I think we need to do as Republicans so that we can be successful in the United States of America. I want to talk to you about the journey to the American dream because that's really what it is all about. That is really why people have come to our shores because they want to be a part of that dream. And when I think about the American dream, I think about how just a couple of weeks ago, I was a headline speaker on the National Review summer cruise that steamed out of Amsterdam and went up into Norway. And when I sat there on several different panels, I thought about the incredible intersection of my life, that the principles of 1955, when William F. Buckley Jr. started the National Review, had married up with a young man that was born in an inner city neighborhood, the same neighborhood that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. grew up in. That's the journey to the American dream. And how can we continue to make sure that it gets there? How can I continue to tell that story, which is so important for our future generations? Well, my journey starts first and foremost with family. When I think about the black community today, only 28% of our children in the black community have mothers and fathers in the home. That was not the life that I grew up with. To have a father that was born in 1920 in Alabama who grew up in South Georgia and have a mother that was born and raised in South Georgia in 1931. My father who served in World War II who taught me that the greatest thing that you could ever do is wear the uniform of this nation, to serve this nation, to give back to this great country. 
to have a mother who served 25 years as a civilian servant to the 6th Marine Corps District Headquarters. And that's why my haircut is <laughs> But to have family that taught you that we are here to make sure that you have a greater opportunity, a greater chance, a greater America, part of the American dream that they did not have. I imagine what it was like for my father to go off to World War II to fight for a country that did not give him all the rights and privileges and benefits that he should have had. But it did not matter. Because when his country called upon him, he answered that call. I thought about the times when I would go up and spend time with my mother there at that headquarters when she was cutting the orders for young men who were coming back from Vietnam and had to be buried. Because that was her job. And I learned what it meant to have a great family that taught me the specialness, the greatness, the exceptionalism of America. And that it's so great to give back to something, not just to yourself. But what was so good about having a family was knowing that I was loved. And what was so good about having a family was knowing that we could sit down and we could share, we could talk about things. And they stress one very important aspect, that's education. When I think about the sacrifices that my family made so that I could go to the only black Catholic school in Atlanta, inner city of Atlanta, Georgia, Our Lady of Lourdes, which was right across the street from Ebenezer Baptist Church, how hard they worked for me to do that. That's what we have to talk about. You know, when you look at the inner city, cities. The inner cities are failing because of the failing schools. And we should be the number one party that is going out there and talking about education because that is the key to success. We should be the ones talking about school choice. We should be the ones that are saying that one of the first things that President Barack Hussein Obama did in Washington, D.C. as President of the United States of America, he took away the school voucher program in Washington, D.C. There were two children that were going to Sidwell Friends. They got booted out so that his two daughters could get a chance to go home. That is not what my parents raised me to understand. That sense of family, that sense of education, that part of that journey to the American dream. You know, when you think about how I am able to stand here before you today, this is the story that we should tell. The story that says that no matter where you come from, no matter where you are born in the United States of America, it is about one simple thing. It's about the opportunity of society. You know, in 1961, when I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, my parents could not walk or go on the beaches in Fort Lauderdale. They could not have the opportunity to go over on Palm Beach Island. But 50 years later, in 2011, when I was sworn into Congress, I was representing the beaches of Fort Lauderdale. I was representing Palm Beach Island. And yes, Rush Limbaugh was one of my constituents. <laughs> that's the journey to the American dream. And that's the story that we need to tell because who we are, as so many of you have talked about, we are the party that believes in that individual. We're the party that believes in the individual's right to sovereignty, the party that believes in the pursuit of happiness, not the guarantee of happiness. That's the other part. And what we have to be able to do is stress a very interesting paradox. We believe in an equality of opportunity. The other side believes in an equality of outcomes. See, the other side would have looked at Alan West in the inner city of Atlanta, Georgia, and would have said, you can only go so far. We have programs that say, you know, we may alter standards so you can have an opportunity to play, but we don't really believe that you can play in the big leagues. But what we believe in as Republicans is that there is a safety net that is out there because every single child that is born in the United States of America is given a ladder. And that ladder is so that you can climb to whatever heights of achievement that you want. Now, there's a safety net that is out there because sometimes we slip off. But equality of opportunity gives you that ladder. Equality of outcomes does not give you a ladder. It does not provide a safety net. 
it provides a hammock. And in that hammock, they allow you to just wistfully live your life away. But the sad thing is that eventually, the hammock does rot. And if you don't believe that the hammock rocks, rots, then look at what happened in Detroit. Look at what is happening in Chicago. When I go back to my neighborhood in Atlanta, Georgia, Auburn Avenue, which was the center place of black entrepreneurial growth, it's just a shell of itself. That is not the opportunity of society. So what must we do? We must talk about the journey to the American dream. We must do that with a conviction that clearly shows, as Ronald Reagan once said, we must paint in bold colors, no longer pretty pastels. The Republican Party cannot win by being a lesser version of the other side. I'll say it again. of Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter, the malaise of Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter sitting in a sweater telling people that maybe you have to turn down your heat just a little bit more because of the Saudi oil embargo crisis. But then came a man that showed us that we can all journey to the American dream. A man that showed us American exceptionalism, a man that was able to communicate, a man that showed us leadership, a man within his heart that had a conviction and a belief in this great nation and its past promises that we must pass on to our subsequent generations. We must continue to talk about that journey to the American dream. And we must do that by talking about each and every one of our personal stories. And we must take those personal stories into communities that many people think that we cannot be successful in. I would challenge you to go back and read the writings of Booker T. Washington at the turn of the century and understand that his belief, his philosophy, was on three pillars. Education, entrepreneurship, and self-reliance. And that was at the turn of the century. The first black conservative. So when you tell me that you can't take our message into a black community, when you tell me that you can't take our message into a Hispanic community, I will tell you that you're just darn wrong. They believe in family. They believe in family. But mostly, mostly, it's about faith. When I was over and we were walking through Amsterdam, something I saw just really was glaring to me. All those beautiful Gothic churches that were built in the early centuries, they're not used as churches anymore. And something happens when a nation loses its faith. Something happens when you lose such an important core part of your belief system the Judeo-Christian faith heritage. Then you start to now not believe and not worship the God with the big G. You start to worship the government with the little G. And that is exactly what is happening here in the United States. How does this party, once again, become connected to that journey to the American dream? First of all, you need to understand why was the Republican Party established in the first place? Why in Ripon, Wisconsin in 1854 was the Republican Party established? One simple reason, liberty, to emancipate people from physical bondage. You think about the Democrat Party and their history. I've always told people there are four different S's of the Democrat Party. It is slavery, it is secession, it is segregation, and it is socialism today. Oh, yes. And that has nothing to do with the four principles and values of the United States of America. Today, this is what the Republican Party must stand for. We must stand for liberty and freedom from economic bondage. When you think about what we're doing, and all of you know about putting people on part-time hours, all of you know about American families that are struggling to put food on the table to have opportunities for their children, to get them a good education. Now is the time for us to be able to make that difference. Now is the time when we stop talking about outreach. Because outreach basically means that during Black History Month or Hispanic Heritage Month, you show up, you have a luncheon or you have a dinner, and then they never see you again. This is about policy inclusiveness. 
if this young man from the inner city of Atlanta, Georgia, can stand here before you today as a conservative, then why in the heck can't we have more standing up as conservatives? It is only because, it is only because we ourselves, as a party, have a recalcitrance. We have to stop reading the New York Times and the Washington Post that tell us about who we should be and try to define us. Our policies and principles work. It is much the same as Thomas Sowell once said. We have to talk about the things that work and stop listening to the things that sound good. Yeah. That's how we turn it around. We also, <laughs> we also have to make the emotional connection with the American people. You always hear everyone go out and talk about the war on women. And we talk about the life of Julia. And we talk about how we love the middle class and all of this. Well, first of all, there is no such thing as class in the United States of America. Right. There may be income levels, but all you need is the drive and determination within your own heart. When you understand our free market economy and system, it rewards your own investment, your own innovation, your own ingenuity, so that you can come from anywhere and you can rise above. That's the message that we have to go out and talk about. But we have to be able to go out and make the rational, emotional discussion and dialogue. Not the irrational one that the other side uses. Most importantly, you just talked about you attended that RNC summer meeting. We need to have a bold strategic vision. We need to have leadership. We need to have a message that we can take all over this great nation that will resound, will resonate, and will contact and connect with every single person in this country. No one wants to fail in America. Now, there are some people out there that, you know, you guys have served in the military, the drill sergeants used to talk about people that are stuck on stupid. <laughs> You're not going to get 100%, so don't even think about it. But you will be able to get 60, 65, 70% of this country that wants a better life, that wants a better way. And they're looking for people that will come and talk to them and tell them what that means. We can't continue to go out and talk about these incredible budget principles and numbers. We've got to make that emotional connection through a strategic plan and a vision. See, I believe, just the same as the Dallas Cowboys, people used to talk about them being America's team. And the Atlanta Braves, people used to talk about them being America's team. The Republican Party needs to be America's party because we are the last line. If it is not us, who will it be? And if we don't stand, then we're going to go the way of the Whigs very soon. And that's the challenge that each and every one of you need to understand. We must be the opportunity party and show that the other side is the dependency party. How can it be in the United States of America where you have people that are going out recruiting Americans to go on food stamps? That's not promoting individual freedom and liberty. That's promoting a sense of servitude servitude to government. My mother always said, self-esteem comes from one thing, doing esteemable things. Yeah. When you are putting people on food stamps, you are not allowed to do stuff. We have to be a party of unity. It says e pluribus unum. The other party is a party of divisiveness, whether it is black against white, men against women, all different types of things, heterosexual, homosexual, you name it. Because what they believe in is the collective. They don't believe in the individual. And they believe if they can pit enough of the collective groups against each other, they will be able to be successful. That's not America. America and the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson talked about the preeminence of the individual, your life, your liberty, your pursuit of happiness, not different collective groups. Let's be the party that goes out and talks to people by uniting them. I know it's possible to do that. Let's also be the principal party, the party of truth, not the party of lying and the party of rhetoric. It was George Orwell that once said, in a universe of deceit, truth is a revolutionary act. 
And when you're speaking the truth, you don't have to be afraid. Why are we so afraid to stand up? Why are we so afraid to say that there are unconstitutional things that this president is doing? If you continue to show fear, you will continue to lose. And as we once would say in, a, in combat zones, you either get to fighting or you get to dying. Make your choice. We must now, in these times, become the guardians of this great constitutional republic. We must become America's party. We must become the people that America rallies to because the American people are suffering. They know something is not right. But they're looking for that beacon. They're looking for the shiny city that sits upon a hill. And each and every one of you must understand that within you, you have a light that you need to brightly shine. And when we come together with that light, people will be drawn unto us and who we are and what we believe in. But if we don't even believe in the principles that we espouse when we have all of these dinners and what have you, if as soon as the local newspaper or radio station or TV challenges us on our principles and beliefs, we start to cower away. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't win on defense. You win on offense. If we continue to be reactive communicators, we don't win. If we don't put them on their heels for what they're doing, which is destroying this country. You show me where in the world progressive socialism has ever been successful. Never. So why are we allowing it to take root in the United States of America? The one single place where people have come to have freedom. Because if America goes away, where do people go? They have nowhere to go. This is it. You know, when I go around here in New Hampshire, I see that nice little license plate. <laughs> the license plate says, live free or die. This is the challenge that I'm going to leave to each and every one of you. Does the journey to the American dream end on your watch? If it ends on your watch, shame on you. Because you will be the first generation that will not leave something better to subsequent generations. And I will tell you, when I know the sacrifices of my mother and father, there is no way in hell I will not pass on something better to my two daughters. And I don't care what people write. I don't care what people say. It is the fight worth having because I will not dishonor the legacy of my parents. You must not dishonor the legacy of your parents, and your grandparents, and our founding fathers. You must go home tonight. And that motto of live free or die must become part of who you are. And every single night, as you look at yourself in the mirror, you must ask yourself, did I own up to that motto, or are they just words on a license plate? Now is our time. If you're not ready for this fight, then please don't pretend to be. But if you are ready for this fight, as it was said by Thomas Paine in 1775, these are the times which try men's souls. When the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink away from their duties, but to those who will make the stand, they will deserve the love and admiration of all men and women. Leave here tonight committed to earn the love and admiration, not of this current generation, not of just the future generations, but the generations that came before us. May God bless you all, and may God keep you.
after saying that the Republican Party was founded in Wisconsin in my <laughs> I was reciting facts. <laughs> it's a flag that was flown in the Colonel's honor over the New Hampshire State House. Um, say something to Colonel West. Please run for president.